And we're going to be conducting a about a three hour session this morning that deals with the off road uh, diesel vehicle regulation. This is a, a little bit of an update from the last time we conducted this because we've had some modifications to the regulation uh, that happened late la or last year. And they just went through the uh, actually they're not all the way through the, the adoption process yet, but they do change some of the stuff we're going to talk about. So what the plan is, is to talk about the way the rule is and then to give you an update on what's coming and what's coming will happen as soon as the Office of Administrative Law actually lets it, uh, lets it go through their process. So here's the information we'll be going over today. We'll start out with the need for emission reduction. So why is this regulation in place? We'll get into the regulatory background, so how this came to be. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the regulation requirements, both the administrative and the emission reduction requirements. We'll get into the other provisions. These are just ones that a lot of people utilize, so we make sure to give them a little bit of extra attention. And then we'll talk about the proposed amendments. This should actually be updated because those are a little bit more interspersed throughout the presentation. Um, so we'll get into those as we're going through as well. So the reason that we regulate diesel particulate matter at the California Air Resources Board is because it is a toxic air contaminant and because it is so small. So diesel particulate is actually so small that when you inhale it, it can go all the way into your bloodstream and interact with your body. And because it's a toxic air contaminant, that makes it a carcinogen. So that's ultimately why we're regulating it at the Air Resources Board. California is also unfortunately one of the highest places for particulate matter. So if you look at the particulate matter in ozone, um, these are the top 10 cities in the US for high emissions. So the US has emissions monitoring throughout the United States. And these are the places that experience the top emissions for both particulate matter and ozone. So California is winning this contest. We're always about top seven of the top 10. If you look at the short-term particulate emissions or the peak particulate emissions, so this would be even just the highest instantaneous levels, California is also winning these contests. So this is all just to say, we do have a problem with particulate matter specifically in California, and that's where these regulations come from. So now we'll get into the regulatory background. CARB identified diesel particulate matter as a toxic air contaminant way back in 1998. That was essentially the beginning of all of these regulations. It does also contain a lot of contaminants from your engine. So there's heavy metals in there. It all absorbs onto these particles. And again, they can get into your lungs, work with your blood pathways and ultimately cause cancer. So that's why this is regulated. After this was determined to be a toxic air contaminant in 1998, CARB created the diesel risk reduction plan in year 2000. Um, that had a few components to it. Some of them are just in California. Some of them are uh, throughout the U.S. So the first one is their restrictor engine standards set by the federal EPA. So when your engine is certified to off-road standard, certified to a certain emission standard, that's all done at the federal level. Um, so that's obviously a U.S.-wide one. That's not just in the state. So throughout the U.S., there are stricter engine standards and your emissions have to be lower. They also set a limit on the amount of sulfur your diesel can contain. Um, so now it has to be under 15 parts per million. It used to be uh, typically in the about 200 range and sometimes as high as 50,000 range for parts per million on the sulfur. It's great for lubrosity for your engine, but unfortunately it does not burn. So when it goes through the combustion cycle of your engine, it does emit a higher particulate matter, the higher sulfur content you have in that fuel. That was another one that was implemented throughout the U.S. So those first two U.S.-wide, this last one was just in California. So California um, had an accelerated plan to apply retrofit particulate filters to the engines or verified diesel emission control strategies. Um, the way that we did that is through regulations. There was a little bit of hiccups with some of that. So we'll get into that a little bit um, when we get into the requirements of the regulation. But just ultimately keep in mind that filtering is a way that you can reduce your particulate matter. So now we'll get into the in-use off-road diesel fuel regulation, or we just call it the off-road regulation. Um, a lot of people just refer to it as doors um, because that's where you report. So just know that that's what we're talking about in this scenario is your in-use off-road vehicles. So this regulation was adopted in 2007. 
There were major revisions in 2010 and it wasn't implemented until 2013. If that sounds like a really long time, that's because it was. So what happened is we actually got sued when this regulation passed. Initially, it required filters on your off-road equipment. When they applied the filters, they had to go outside of the engine compartment. And a lot of times they were blocking the view of the operator. So we actually got sued on a safety basis because it's unsafe operation if you're blocking the operator's view. We lost the lawsuit. We had to revise the regulation. So now the way that it works is a fleet average rule. Instead of requiring a filter, we just require you to meet a fleet average that says your all of your engines average out to a certain um, number. And then that shows us that they're overall getting cleaner over time. Um, this is the way that we chose to reduce PM and NOx emissions. So it ultimately gets us to the same goal, even though it no longer requires filters. So who is affected by the off-road regulation? It applies regardless of how you're using this, so long as you don't meet a few certain exemptions. So if you have a business, if it's an individual operating it for profit, if it's a government agency, all of these fall under the off-road regulation. So now we'll get into the applicability for the off-road regulation. The first thing you want to look for is, is it self-propelled? So if you have an engine and it's powering a generator, it's on a trailer, you would have to pull that trailer in order for it to move. That makes it a portable engine. It's not an off-road uh, self-propelled engine. So it does have to be self-propelled to fall under this regulation. It also has to be 25 horsepower or greater. So if you have a mini skid steer, a mini excavator, things like that, they're rated at 24.9 horsepower. Hilarious joke by the manufacturers, totally works. They are exempt. So 24.9, you don't have any requirements. It's only once it's 25 or more that these requirements apply. It also has to be a true off-road vehicle, so certified to off-road standards in order for it to automatically be included in the off-road regulation. There are a few um, exemptions where they were automatically included into the off-road regulation. A lot of times what happens when we're making our regulations is uh, people participate in the regulatory process and they advocate for their vehicle type to be either included or excluded from a regulation. In this case, there were a few um, types of stakeholders that participated that advocated for to be included in this regulation because they didn't want to be regulated by the truck and bus regulation. And we actually enveloped them into this regulation. Okay, so now we'll get into the engine certification. So remember I said it has to be certified to off-road standards to be automatically included into this regulation. So we'll get into what that means. Um, we can see I have a water truck as the image on this, it's because water trucks are almost the number one vehicle that we run into that people think are off-road and they're actually on-road. So if it's certified to on-road standards, if you look at your emission control label on your engine and it's certified to on-road standards, that's an on-road vehicle. With water trucks, a lot of times, you know, you use it only off-road, you use it only at your construction sites, you low boy it to the next construction site, it's not registered with the DMV, None of that matters. When an inspector looks at it, they're going to look at that certification of the engine. And if it's certified to on-road standards, they're going to regulate it as an on-road vehicle. So that's why we always highlight that one specifically, um, because it will be looked at normally as an on-road vehicle. So now we'll get into the emission control label. You can see typically they have that same writing at the top, and that's what you're going to be looking for when you look for your emission control label. So it says important engine information. That's not exactly standardized, but it's almost always the case. So when you're looking for your emission control label, there are a lot of um, stickers on the engines. There's a lot of serial numbers and things like that. This is the one you're looking for, important engine information. So just remember that. When you're looking at it, what you want to look for is the engine family name because that's standardized and that's going to tell you what type of vehicle it is. So the first letter is going to tell you what year it's certified to. The next three are going to be the manufacturer certification. And then that um, fourth one is what you want. So this one, you can see why is the first letter that's going to designate the year, the model year of this engine. The next three are PKX. So that's a Perkins engine. And then L is actually telling us that that is an off-highway engine. So that's what you're looking for for these um, to see the engine certification. You can also look in the paragraph below. And it says this engine conforms to 2000 US EPA regulations for large non-road compression ignition engines. So 
non-road, off-highway, off-road, all interchangeable, all means it's an off-road engine. For this one, we have a cat engine. You can see the engine family name follows that same designation. So we have the eight, that's a 2008 engine. CPX is the designation for a cat engine. And then this one has an H, so that's a highway engine. So on-road, H. And again, you can see it in the paragraph. They do also explain that that's certified to on-road standards. There's also a lookup. You can go to the EPA website. You can actually type in just in information about family naming conventions into Google and EPA, and this article pops up, and that will tell you how to decode your engine family name so you don't have to memorize any of the things I just said, which is great. Here are the on-road vehicles that are included. So if you have an oil field or natural gas workover rig, even if it's certified to on-road standards, those are included in the off-road regulation. That also includes tier zero vehicles. So any oil field natural gas workover rig was absorbed into the off-road regulation. And again, that's because the oil field and natural gas communities participated in the regulation and they said they want to be included in it. Um, they're not legal for on-road use. They actually never operate on-road. So we did agree with that and go ahead and include them in the off-road regulation. For two engine cranes and water well drilling rigs, those are also included in the off-road regulation, even if they have an on-road engine or a tier zero engine. The reason we included these is because that secondary engine is technically an auxiliary engine. A lot of times it's over 50 horsepower and we didn't want to require them to have a secondary um, regulation that applies because it would fall under the portable regulation. So we absorb them into the off-road regulation. What I always say as a word of warning with that is at the state, we regulated it as all off-road. The local air districts have their own regulations and they can be more strict than the state regulations. So if you have a two engine vehicle, check with your local air district that that secondary engine does or doesn't require a permit because they may still require a permit at the local level for that secondary engine. Um, certain other types of two engine vehicles also fall under the regulation, but they do have to meet certain conditions. So we'll get into that. That secondary engine has to be greater than or equal to 50 horsepower. So again, 49 horsepower, that's not included. It also has to be certified. So no tier zero engines, only tier one through four to be included in the off-road regulation. It cannot be subject to the public agency and utility regulation. No two engine sweepers and it has to be fully integrated into the design of the vehicle. So if you have an on-road vehicle and you add a pony engine on or a generator on the back, anything like that, that's added on after manufacture, you have an on-road vehicle with a portable engine. If it's integrated into the design, then it potentially is an off-road vehicle. So the highlights, to remember when you have a two engine vehicle is both of the engines do have to be reported for it to be compliant. Um, they are both going to affect your fleet average as well. And just double check with your air district, your local air district. Um, they, you can always call them and see if your equipment requires an additional permit. If it does require a permit, you're able to get a portable permit for that and still register it as an off-road vehicle as well. And then you're in compliance with the state requirements and the local requirements. We do have some exemptions from the off-road regulation. So locomotives are subject to interstate commerce, so they are not reg regulated by the off-road regulation. The marine engines have a commercial vessel regulation, so they're not included in the off-road regulation, even though they may have off-road engines. Recreational and personal use vehicles. So we have a quad picture up here, but this even applies if you do have some sort of construction equipment that you use on your property for private purposes. Um, so long as you're not using it in uh, for profit or for a business, things like that, that type of equipment still would be exempt of this regulation. Tactical support equipment. For tactical support equipment, in order to qualify for that exemption, it has to be deployable. So it can't be just used on a military base. If you contract with the military to do work, that's not tactical support equipment. It's a really slim identification. It has to be deployable. They have to use it for tactical training. Um, things like that. So those type of engines, it's very, it's a more rare exemption than it sounds like. So if you are a private contractor, you're not going to meet that exemption. And something else I always like to warn with that is sometimes the military will sell their equipment 
and it will have the weirdest emission control label you've ever seen. It says um, like federal security or there's just no information on there. So if you are at a military auction and you do want to buy a piece of equipment, just double check that engine certification because you as a private citizen or private contractor would not be able to legally operate that equipment. Um, two engine sweepers, we already talked about those fall under the truck and bus regulations, so they're not included in the off-road regulation. Anything used at intermodal rail yards or ports is subject to the cargo handling regulation. And then anything exclusively used for agriculture. So if you have something that you use 100% of the time for agriculture, um, that's also exempt of this regulation. So there are some partial exemptions. I call them partial exemptions because you're required to report and label, but you're not subject to the emissions portion of the regulation. So if you have a low use vehicle that's used less than 200 hours per year, you have to report and label that equipment, but it doesn't affect your fleet average and it's not subject to the emissions portions requirement of the regulations. Emergency vehicles, same deal, dedicated snow removal vehicles, um, if you have equipment that's used a majority of the time for agricultural purposes. So if you have a piece of equipment that you use for crop preparation 65% of the time, and then you use it in your processing facility the rest of the time, that's not 100% exempt. We do want you to report and label that equipment and tell us how many hours you used it and um, for each subdivision of that. But so long as it's over 50% of the time for agriculture, then it's partially exempt. So again, doesn't affect your fleet average doesn't have the emissions requirement, just has the reporting and labeling requirement. Okay, review questions. So what is the minimum horsepower for a vehicle to be affected by the off-road regulation? 25. Anything smaller, we don't have to worry about. Um, so what should you check to make sure that your vehicle is truly an off-road vehicle? Engine family works. When where is that located? On your emission control label. So remember that important engine information. Um, ECL is what they're called. Also, just as a side requirement, those are uh, federally required on your engines. So if you don't have one, you can actually get a citation just for that. So make sure that they are um, labeled so that and if an inspector looks at it, they know what it's certified to, what year it is, and how it should be used. So what are the other type um, vehicle for two engine vehicles? What qualifications do they have to meet in order to be considered an off-road vehicle? What, what horsepower does that auxiliary engine have to be? 50 for the, off, for the auxiliary. It has to be certified, remember? So no tier zero engines. It can't be subject to the public agency and utility regulations. So if you have a public vehicle, public fleet, that vehicle is not going to get into the off-road regulations. It can't be a street sweeper. Those are also public utility vehicles a lot of the time, but if they're not, they fall under the truck and bus regulation. And then that auxiliary engine has to be fully integrated into the design. So remember, it can't be added on, it has to have come that way from the manufacturer. So now we'll get into some of the requirements for the regulation, so how to comply. There are a couple ways to comply with this regulation. Um, I'll talk about the most common, the most, so we'll just make sure that everybody understands that. Uh, but ultimately, the way that it works is you report all of your equipment that meets the applicability, and that goes toward your fleet average. Your fleet average is going to be based on the horsepower of the equipment and the age of the engine. So if you have an older engine, uh, but it's a lower horsepower, it's actually going to have a little bit less effect. It's not going to drive up your fleet average quite as much. The horsepower is going to be what determines the most. Your fleet average is going to be compared to a fleet target. The fleet target is set based on your fleet size. So small fleets have a target, medium fleets have a target, large fleets have a target. Your fleet target is going to get lower over time until the end of your timeline. Small fleets have until 2028 to comply. Medium and large fleets have until 2023. We did alter this presentation a little bit for this purpose because there's a little bit of changes if you're a medium or large fleet this year. Ultimately, as long as your fleet average is lower than your fleet target, you're in compliance. 
you affect your fleet average by adding vehicles. So if you add newer, cleaner vehicles, it's going to lower your fleet average. If you add older vehicles, it's going to raise your fleet average. And then there, like I said, there are a few types of vehicles that don't affect your emissions. You just report and label them. So again, your low use vehicles, dedicated emergency, snow removal, anything that's partially exempt, you can report, you report and label it. So you show us you have it, but it does not affect your fleet average. So these are the fleet sizes. If you have under 2,500 horsepower, you're considered a small fleet. This also includes municipality fleets and low population counties and captive attainment fleets, regardless of their total horsepower. But for medium and large fleets, at this point in the regulation, their requirements are almost identical. So if you have over 2,501 horsepower, your requirements are going to be the same. So your medium or large fleet. For captive attainment counties, um, those areas were in compliance with the NOx standards, so uh, nitrogen oxides, when this rule was created and the ozone standard. Because of that, they got a little bit of extra leeway under this rule. So they can comply with the small fleet requirements, no matter the size of the fleet, for that fleet that's in those attainment areas. If you do have a large fleet and you say a portion of your fleet is up there, you can actually contact doors and they can help you identify that as a fleet portion. And just that section of your fleet can comply with the captive attainment requirements. If you do report your fleet as captive attainment, you should also have green labels instead of the red labels. If you do see a green label outside of a captive attainment area, that's out of compliance and that can be cited. This is a map of the captive attainment area. So as you can see, it's mostly in Northern California. Um, we do have a little bit on the central coast as well. If you do have a captive attainment fleet, just know you're only allowed to operate within those areas. And again, if you're caught outside of the areas, then you can get in a little bit of hot water there. This is also a list of the captive attainment counties. And I do just wanna highlight specifically if you're in the Sonoma area, it's based on the air basin, not county lines. So Sonoma is, a little bit um, different than a lot of the counties where it goes between two air basins. So you have to know which area you're operating in in order to stay in compliance. So just make sure that you're only in the captive team areas. So fleet portions, if you, again, want to uh, identify a part of your fleet as a captive attainment fleet, you do have to contact doors in order to do that. You can't do it on your end through the reporting system but you are able to comply with the small fleet requirements if you do have a portion of your fleet that operates in a captive attainment area. So for rental and lease vehicles, who is responsible? We see a lot of rental equipment for the off-road sector. So this does happen a lot. If it's rented less than a year, it's the owner's responsibility. If the lease is longer than a year, they can ultimately decide who's responsible in the lease agreement. So as a renter, why would you want it in your lease agreement that you're responsible for a piece of equipment that you don't own? Remember, if you have newer equipment that's added to your fleet, it actually lowers your fleet average. So maybe you can't afford to purchase a new piece of equipment, but you do need to lower your fleet average. If you enter a, a rental agreement that's longer than a year and you stipulate in that agreement that that is your responsibility, you're going to report it, you can lower your fleet average that way. There is an idling limitation in this regulation. So there's a five minute limit on any unnecessary idling. What I will say as a um, word of warning with that is a lot of equipment has different reasons that it may require idling. So we've seen, you know, DPF regeneration requires an idling. Maybe your manual requires a 30 minute warm up, a 30 minute cool down. Those are all valid reasons to idle your vehicle. But you do have inspectors that are going to look at this. And if they just see a vehicle, running, there's no operator in it, it's idling, they're going to start timing it. So what I always say as a word of advice for that is just to keep some sort of documentation with the equipment that can show that there is a reason why it's idling, and that could prevent you from receiving a citation. Some reasons that you can idle, if it's queuing, so lining up, waiting for a product, maintenance, or ensuring safe operation for the operator. What doesn't apply for that is a cooling station. You can't use your vehicles as a cooling station for the off-road regulation, so just be aware of that. For medium and large fleets, there's an additional requirement that they have to have a written idling policy. There is no 
standard on what this has to include. So it could be just a single document that says don't idle. That could be your idling policy. It could be something um, like Caltrans has that has every single piece of equipment and why it's allowed to idle and for how long. Ultimately, that's up to you. We do have some examples on our enforcement division page. The link for that is here if anyone does need it. If you're going to sell this type of equipment in the state of California, you are required to include a sales disclosure in that contract language, and then you have to retain that sales disclosure for three years. It does have to be exactly this paragraph, and it essentially just notifies the buyer that there is a regulation in California that applies to this vehicle type. This one is the combined sales disclosure. So it works if you're selling on-road vehicles, off-road vehicles, portable vehicles, you can just put it into your contract language and then you're protected. If you sell at an auction house, also be aware that it is still your responsibility to verify that they include this language. There are a few types of reporting that are required under the off-road regulation. Initial reporting has been required since 2009. So that's for all fleet sizes. You can report online using the door system. That is a free tool, so there's no cost to report, and you do have to make sure that all of the information you're inputting is correct. There is no automated way that we verify that information you're inputting, and if an inspector looks and the information does not match what you reported, you can potentially receive a citation for that as well. If you miss your reporting deadline, so if you have not reported yet, all of the initial reporting deadlines have passed, the system will not flag you for opening a fleet today. We have fleets coming into California every day. There's no way that we would be able to do that. Um, so just make sure that you're getting that information in as soon as possible before you're caught in the field with unreported equipment. So this is your annual reporting. Um, it's the responsible official affirmation of reporting. For your fleet sizes, reporting is required through the end of your timeline. And again, until you're compliant with your fleet average. So if you're beyond your timeline, but you're not compliant with your fleet average, you do have to continue reporting until you're compliant. What you're required to report is any changes to your fleet. So if you've added vehicles throughout the year, you're required to report that within 30 days, but you do wanna verify before you do your annual ROAR that they're all in there. Um, if you have any low-use vehicles or partial ag vehicles, this is also when you would enter those hour meter readings to make sure that you've reported um, your usage to us and that they're staying compliant with those requirements. If you sell or purchase a vehicle, again, we want that to be reported within 30 days into the system. If you're beyond that 30 days, again, you can potentially receive a citation. So just be aware that it does have to be reported within 30 days. And a lot of times they do verify purchase agreements with that as well um, to make sure that that information is correct. We do have hard copy forms available. I always I try to discourage that a little bit just because um, we see a lot more errors with the hard copy forms. People can write it down wrong and then we still would have to enter it on our end. So you're just introducing a lot more opportunities for human error to mistype something if you're using the hard copy forms. And again, it is a free tool to use the door system. And it does retain your information for the next year. So say you make no changes to your fleet, you would just go in and certify that all the information is still the same. We do have staff available um, five days a week to help with the regulation and to help with reporting. You can either contact them via email or from the DOORS hotline. Um, they're really knowledgeable and very helpful. They can help you with fleet planning and things like that as well if you're not sure how to make changes to your fleet in order to be compliant. There is also a labeling requirement. You have 30 days to report your equipment and then you have 30 days to label it. So if you're a big risk taker, 60 days total at the top of the limit there. All the vehicles do have to be labeled. It should be that red background white lettering unless you're a captive attainment fleet and then it's that green background white lettering. CARB does assign that equipment identification number to you. So when you report your piece of equipment into doors, it generates that random alphanumeric number for you but you are responsible for applying it to your equipment. So we don't send you a label, nothing's gonna come in the mail. You do have to generate it yourself. If you want to uh, purchase a label, we do have a list of vendors available um, that have sent their labels into us and we've checked that they meet all the specifications of the rule. We also have people paint them on there, that's fine. Um, so again, just red background, white lettering and you want it to be legible. 
For the vinyl labels, keep an eye on them because they do get very sun bleached at a certain point and you would want to replace them. You just replace them again with that same exact number that it already had. Just make sure that it stays legible for the life of the vehicle. And that also includes if it gets scratched off or something like that, because that does happen as well a lot. These labels are required to be on both sides of the vehicle. When we first passed this regulation, they were only required to be on one side. Inspectors would do inspections at the end of the day and the vehicles would be all turned so that the labels were facing in. So they couldn't verify the compliance. So we actually amended the regulation and now they're required on both sides of the vehicle. Again, the label specifications, there are some specific requirements. Typically, inspectors are just going to make sure that they're red background, white lettering and that they are legible. So in clear view and still readable, so still in good condition. If you do want to order them online, again, we have that list of label vendors. A lot of times the dealerships where you purchase the vehicle will sell them to you as well. Some issues we see with the labels. A lot of times people will report their vehicle and then they don't put the label on. That can get you a citation. So again, make sure that you're putting the label on and it does have to be on both sides. So you want to make sure it's on each side of the vehicle. A lot of times we'll see they aren't in clear view. So you can see in this picture, they put it inside the operator cage. If somebody's using that vehicle, I wouldn't be able to see it doing the inspection. It is not in clear view. So it's not actually in compliance with the regulation. So make, make sure it's somewhere that can be seen. We do also see a lot of times on the excavators, they'll be behind the door that slides and sometimes the door even gets stuck out open. Um, so you can't see that. Again, just make sure it's in clear view. Make sure that the equipment identification number, that EIN that's on the door is matching what you have reported and one label on each side, it should line up with what you have indoors. We'll see incorrect EINs sometimes. So this one started getting sun damaged. It was cracking. It was peeling. It was getting hard to see. And they did the right thing and they replaced it. Probably somebody just wrote it down and said, oh, make me this label. And that first G turned into a six. Doing the right thing still can just probably correct this. Not a huge issue, but just double check that it matches what you're originally reported. And that is what's reported indoors. Something else to look for is it does always follow the same pattern. So if it's not two letters, one number, one letter, two numbers, that's going to be an instant red flag to an inspector. And you should just know that you probably just need to go back into your door system and double check what it should be in there. We do have the website for the reporting system. You can also subscribe for email updates. That'll send you notifications of any changes or reporting deadlines, things like that. You can also see the doors login on the bottom left corner of this. So that's where you would go into your reporting portal. That takes you here where you enter your login information to access the doors reporting website. Once you're logged in, you'll have a couple options. So you can either click to report an off-road diesel fleet, which is what we're talking about today. There is also a button for LSI. So if you have a large spark ignition forklift fleet or ground support equipment, things like that. That would be an LSI fleet. So it actually is a different login, a different regulation. For the off-road fleet, you can see we have a test fleet reported. That's actually a hyperlink. Test fleet is blue. Um, so you would click on that to get into your fleet information. The first thing you want to look at is your compliance snapshot page. This is going to tell you your fleet size, the number of vehicles you have reported, and most importantly, whether or not your fleet is in compliance. So it tells you right at the top. As currently reported, your fleet has met the requirements through January 1st, 2023. Because this is a large fleet, remember January 1st, 2023 is the end date. So this is a compliant fleet. They don't, if they don't add any older equipment, they're going to be compliant throughout the regulation. So there's no other action you would need to take. They don't have to retire any equipment. They're just going to stay compliant. So this is the breakdown of the compliance summary. So it tells you, again, your fleet average and what the projected fleet average is going to be. This is an older screenshot. So you can see it was saying in 2022, the average is going to be 1.7, um, but it has maintained 1.7 for a while for that one. So it tells you when you're in compliance and then what your fleet average is going to be projected outward until the end of your compliance timeline. This is the VACT credit summary. So VACT, we haven't talked about much yet. Essentially, it's the second way to comply that isn't the fleet average method. It works by retiring, replacing, or repowering 10% of your fleet every year until you're compliant with the average. 
When you want to go to report, you can go to the ROAR forms page under other tools. It is an electronic form, an electronic submittal. Um, so when you report everything, if your fleet is reported and in compliance, you're going to see all of these green check marks down the left-hand side. That means everything is in order, your fleet is compliant, and you can submit your form. When you want to submit your form, you click the request pin and proceed to eROAR page. It is going to send that pin to a registered email for your responsible official. So just make sure the responsible official is the per a person that's going to stay with your company because we do have it a lot of times that that'll be assigned to an admin person and then they get locked out of the account if that person leaves. So just make sure that either everybody has, multiple people can have that same login information or make sure that it's a person who is actually ultimately responsible for the company. For record keeping, there are some records you are required to maintain internally, even though we don't ask for them to be submitted into the website. Um, so typically it has to do with if you're filtering equipment, we want you to maintain that filter information on site. It can potentially be requested. They typically would only be requested in the event of an audit. So if your whole fleet is being audited by ARB, that's when you would potentially have to submit these additional records. What are the general requirements for labeling off-road vehicles? What color does it have to be? Red. And what color letters? White. Which side of the vehicle? Both sides of the vehicle. And then easily legible. So remember, if it starts getting sun damaged, if it's scraped off, if it's unreadable in any way, um, we're not counting that as a labeled vehicle. So those are your basic requirements for vehicle labeling. How soon do you have to report a vehicle into doors after you purchase it? 30 days. And then how long do you have to label it? Same number. Great. 30 days. So 30 days to report. Um, same if you sell a vehicle. So you want to report it within 30 days. I don't think I went into this too much into detail also, but um, if you don't release the vehicle or when you're selling it, the next person can't actually uh, report it into their fleet. If you do release it, all they have to do is type in the EIN and claim it. And all of that information, the engine information is already reported. So it makes it really easy for them. They do not want to create a new EIN for that vehicle. So make sure that you're releasing it. And that has to be within 30 days as well. So what should you do if you buy a vehicle and you can't transfer the EIN? So say I sold my vehicle. I didn't release it. What should that person do? Should they call and yell at me? No, that's probably not going to work. But you could call them and try to get them to release it. If if I'm still unresponsive, you're calling me, I'm not answering my phone, I don't recognize your number, I don't want to pick up a spam call, you just create a new EIN number? No, right? Because we don't want double reporting. Your, your information can actually get flagged in the website if you create a duplicate vehicle. So if we see a serial number and then the same serial number is reported, it can flag your account. So what we want you to do is call the doors hotline. They can actually release it from the back end. You just show your proof of purchase. We'll release that vehicle for you. You can claim it into your fleet. And then again, all of that information is stored in there. Um, but double check the engine information just to make sure that it is correct. What reporting is required annually? The responsible official affirmation of reporting or your ROAR forms are required annually. And those are due by March 1st of every year. When we originally proposed this regulation and put it out there, it, it was going to require filtration. And we had a little problem with that because we got sued. Until we could figure out how we were going to write this regulation in such a way that the federal government would allow us to enforce it, we could not enforce it. So it was rewritten and EPA then gave us the exemption of what we call authorization to start enforcing the emission related components. So the rule actually passed in 2008, but we didn't actually get to enforce any of the emission related stuff until 2013. That's what I'm gonna start covering right now. There's an advisor on that end. It includes two basic parts of the rule. One is something we call a restriction on adding vehicles or a tier ban. I'll go through that, what it is and how it affects your ability to add vehicles to your fleet. The second thing is how you actually meet the emission requirements. And I'm, I'm going to go over in basic terms right now, and I'll repeat this again. So the way this rule is set up is essentially, if you have any vehicle that is as described earlier, 
25 horsepower California diesel off-road, all that kind of stuff. You're supposed to report it to us, required to report it to us. When you do that, we ask you for engine information. And because we have a connection with federal EPA, we know exactly what the emission standards were for that particular engine at the time it was certified brand new. We take those numbers for every vehicle you report, and there's a formula that I'm going to show you a little bit later, and we calculate an average emission rate for your fleet, an average emission rate of oxides of nitrogen. That's your fleet average right here. Now, everybody's fleet average is going to be different because everybody's fleets are different. Unless you have an identical fleet, if you've had the exact same equipment, model year, type, size, everything, then their fleet average will be the same. But because they don't, and practically nobody does, everybody's fleet average is slightly different. In the rule, we set target rates. And when we calculate the average, instead of using your actual fleet certification standards, we use target rates and we create another number. And we compare your average to that number. Now, as long as your average is at or below whatever this number is, your entire fleet's in compliance. Doesn't matter what you have, zeros, tier zeros, one, two, threes, four, four, it doesn't matter. Your entire fleet's in compliance. Now, every year, what do you think the targets do? Do they go up or down? They go down. That's the idea. The target goes down, that means emissions are going to go down. So targets go down. We recalculate this number. And the only way your number gets recalculated is if you change the makeup of your fleet. As long as uh, the targets keep going down, and at some point, your average is going to be above whatever the target rate is. Whenever that happens, that's the year that you're required to do something to bring your, your average down. And as long as you stay there, your fleet's in compliance. Will the targets keep going down once you've reached your, the end of your timeline? For large and medium fleets, the end of the timeline was 2023. And the answer is no, they're not creating new targets. You have to meet that target. There's more than one method to comply. I'll go over something called the fleet average, which I'm talking about. I'm also going to go over something called the best available control technology method, which is a completely different way of looking at it, but it allows you to follow your own path without worrying about the fleet average. That'll make more sense when I get to that point. However, the, the backed method does not necessarily mean you could be in compliance with this, but it does not necessarily mean that your fleet average is in compliance. And at the end of your timeline, again, medium and large fleets, it was 2023. Um, at the end of your timeline, you still have to meet the fleet average, no matter what you did with the back method. And if you're not in compliance with the fleet average at the end of your timeline, you have to keep going until you meet that end fleet average. All right. So that's what we're going to talk about. The back method is also something that's called turnover or putting cleaner engines in. I'll, I'll explain all this as we go through. The tier band. I'm going to bring this all up because this is the text version of it. There's another slide that I'm going to show you in just a second that I like better. But before I get there, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page as far as what tier band means when I say that phrase. Tier band doesn't mean that you can't own a piece of equipment, or at least traditionally, it doesn't mean that. If you already owned it when this rule came into place, when these dates were in place, the rule did not say that you had to get rid of that equipment. It said that when you were adding a new piece of equipment to your fleet, one that you did not own prior to the dates on here, then you were restricted on what level of equipment you could add. That's a tier ban. Anything lower than what the restriction is for your particular size fleet and the year, you couldn't add legally. Now, this is an easier way of looking at it right here. Let me bring it all up. This is the rainbow chart for tier bands. You can see that on the left-hand side, we have medium, large fleets and small. And on the top, we have years. And if you look at where we are today, we're all the way down at the end of the chart. We're in 2023. So all according to this chart, the way it stands, all large, medium, and small fleets, basically all fleets, are no longer allowed to add anything less than a tier three to their fleet at this point. Now, this is a trick question because I just told you this information. If you had a tier three prior to 2023, could you actually had a tier two prior to 2023? Could you still keep it? Yeah. It's not banning stuff you have. It's banning stuff you add. Okay. There is a little bit of a catch to this, though. And that is, if you went into the reporting system today or yesterday or tomorrow, and you tried to add a tier zero or a tier one or a tier two, the system would let you do it. It would put up an error message and say, 
hold on a second, are you sure you want to do this? And you would have to click past a, a little thing that says that. But ultimately, if you did click past it, you know, like all those agreements that you sign, you never read them, right? If you went past that, it would let you add those band tiers. And there's a reason for that, because in this in business, you may not necessarily just buy one vehicle. You may be purchasing somebody's whole fleet. Maybe somebody's going out of business and they just want to get rid of all of it. Well, if you're in that position where you're buying a fleet from somebody and their fleet is in compliance at the time you buy them, there is no limit on what you can add. You can add their entire fleet, even if it has zeros, ones, and twos at this point. Let's face it, though, that's probably not the reason they're selling their fleet. So if you purchase a whole fleet and they're not in compliance with the tier ban, then the, I mean, with the uh, fleet average, then the tier ban applies. And you can only add those pieces of equipment that are tier three or above. All right, that's what the tier ban is. Now, there will be a modification. There has been a modification to this in the updates to this rule. And we'll, I'll go through those. Okay, let's look at the tier ban extension. So I don't know how much we've said this this morning already, but you need to be aware that the, the this regulation went through an update last year. And by that, I mean there were amendments to the regulation. And those amendments have changed several things about the rule requirements. And one of the things that has been changed is this ban. Instead of stopping at tier three, it's being extended all the way to tier four interim. Uh, and you, you can see based on the large and medium, small, and the tiers and the dates. So if we have a large and medium fleet, uh, by 2024, you're not allowed this, you're not allowed to add anything less than your tier four interim. Small fleets also will not be allowed to add anything less than Tier 4 interim, meaning Tier 3 is proposed to be banned for all fleet sizes beginning in 2024. Also starting in 2024, large and medium fleets will no longer be able to add Tier 4 interim vehicles to their fleet. Small fleets have until 2028 to add these vehicles, but again they are banned starting in 2028. Ultimately, Fleets will only be allowed to add Tier 4 final vehicles into their fleet once these band dates are fully phased in. Let's take a look at the equipment phase-out part of this. So the rule also, the updates, have also modified the idea of being able to keep a piece of equipment indefinitely. Originally, the regulation never said you had to get rid of anything. You just had to lower your fleet average or stay in compliance with the backed option. And when I get to backed option, I'll explain exactly how that works again. Now we're going to be going through a series of steps where even older engines are going to be banned from operation in California. They're going to be phased out over time. 2024 for small, medium, and large fleets, and 2028 for small fleets, banning tier zeros for being used, unless it's listed as low use. You can designate something low use, and it would be exempt from being banned. But if you're not designated as low use, then it would not be legal to operate or own in the state of California. Uh, 2036, um, like I said, it doesn't apply to low use, but by 2036, even the low use tier zeros would be able, would be banned. So if you have those old engines right now that you need to keep, you can designate them as low use uh, you know, through next year. And then by 2036, even the tier zeros are not going to be allowed. For two engine vehicles, they can't be operated once the engine reaches the phase out date. And there's a phase out for tier one tier, and tier two as well. This is the chart for that. So you can see we've got large medium fleets, the band of the year, the age of the equipment for all three types of tiers. Ultimately by 2032, even with small fleets, uh, the tier twos are not gonna be allowed to be used in the state of California. Again, unless you designate them as low use. For fleet averages, as I said, we look at, um, it's on NOx emissions, even though we're focusing on NOx emissions because we can't focus on PM because of the lawsuit, we still are going to get the PM emission reductions because when the feds certify an engine, they certify it across the board. They don't just certify it for one thing. They certify it for NOx, they certify it for PM, they certify it for CO, HC, everything. And they don't allow an engine to be a new certified engine to have high PM emissions and low NOx emissions. It doesn't happen. So we know we're going to get those. 
Uh, as I said, we compare your existing fleet average to the target, and the targets get more stringent over time. There is math involved. I'm going to show you what the formula is in a few seconds or a few moments. If you don't like math, don't worry. You don't have to know math to do this. The system actually does the math for you. I'm going to show you the formula because you should know what that is. But again, pass this class unless you really want to get into it. You don't have to remember it per se. We use something called emission factors when we're doing this. An emission factor is nothing more than an amount of emissions per unit of activity. So in the case of NOx, it's NOx in grams per horse, brake horsepower hour. And that is a measurement that for when you run the engine, each engine has a certain number of horsepower that it's rated to. And in an hour, how much emission will it put out per each of those horsepower? Brake horsepower is a term that's used to describe the usable force that's coming out the back wheels. If you're not familiar with this, you, when you rate an engine, you know, without any um, friction or heat loss, it can be rated at 100 horsepower or whatever that number is, but the actual useful horsepower is always less because you have gearing changes, you have heat loss, you've got friction, you've got all kinds of things that will drop that usable number down to a much lower level in some cases. So we always use the, the uh, brake horsepower. And a lot of times that's calculated at something called the flywheel. I don't want to get into engine technology too much, but basically the flywheel is where it's connected to the gears that run the device. This is grams per brake horsepower hour. And as I said a few moments ago, doors will assign those emission factors based on what EPA standards say that that engine was certified to when it was brand new. They will be listed if you want to know what yours are. They are supposed to be listed on the emission control label, ECL emission control label. You know, it, the uh, when the feds again certify an engine, one of the requirements that they have is the manufacturer put a label on the engine somewhere that lists the family name for that particular engine, and it lists all the components that came on that engine to control emissions, as well as emissions factors. Those labels are uh, required to be on those engines now. We don't always find them, but when inspectors go out to look, that's one of the things they're looking for. And if they don't see it, that can be written up as a citation or a notice of violation for having a missing label or one that's illegible. If you're using on-road engines in off-road vehicles, now this is an off-road rule. One of the things we look for is, is that engine that you're in your piece of equipment certified to an off-road standard. There are cases like the uh, the two-engine water well drilling rigs, the two-engine cranes. Those will have on-road engines in them, and they're not certified the same way. I'll show you a tier chart in a few moments, but tiers are certified based on the year of manufacture and a horsepower category. And wherever the two combine, that's what the tier is. Engines, for on-road purposes, are certified to a model year standard. So a 2007 engine versus a 2010 engine. And they are different ways of certifying it. But because we can have on-road engines in some ways in this rule, we have to translate those on-road standards to off-road standards. So there will be uh, an emission factor calculation that does that. And again, as long as you let the reporting system know this, it should happen in the background automatically. If there's a problem with that, the door staff is really good about figuring that kind of stuff out. So make sure you, you contact them if you have issues with that. Okay, how do I make my fleet average go down? You might replace vehicles, you might repower them, you might do different things. But how do I know which one of the engines I have is going to give me the most bang for my buck? Which one is going to make the most sense to work on or do something with? There's a tool within the reporting system that will give you this information. When you go to the fleet snapshot, it's going to give you a breakdown of how many vehicles you have, what your total horsepower is, compliance dates, and what your next compliance state is. Well, if you look at the horsepower, horsepower that's being used in the fleet average, that is going to be a linked item. If you click on that link, it should give you a breakdown of all the vehicles that are being used to calculate your fleet average. So you can look at it in terms of that and say, this engine, if I do this, is going to give me a lot more positive things in calculating my average than the one on the bottom of the list. This is the tier chart. So this is a tier chart for off-highway engines or off-road engines. And if you look at the left-hand side, 
That's the engine model year or the year that the engine was manufactured. Not the vehicle model year, the engine model year. On the top, you have emission horsepower categories. They're ranked, usually it's just like a 50 or 75 horsepower ranges. But for the first one, for example, 25 to 49 horsepower, that's a 25 horsepower range. That's the smallest engine that actually has a tier standard. And if you go down to, let's say, 1998, 7.1 represents the, uh, the certification level for that engine when it was brand new. 7.1 grams per brake horsepower hour of NOx emissions were what was allowed for that engine. The chart is color coded to tell you what the tier is. Anything in white obviously is a tier zero. That's the oldest engines. Tier one is going to be kind of this yellowish color. Tier two is kind of the orange brown color. Tier three is this, I'm not sure what to call that, but let's call it pinkish purple color. Tier four interim is the cyan or light blue color. And then tier four final is that purple color on the bottom. One thing should stand out. When was the last time there was a tier certification? What year? 2015 and later, uh, there really has not been another addition to this chart since then. So technically, theoretically, every engine for sale right now should be tier four final. Every new engine for sale should be tier four final. That's not exactly true. There are some engines in the higher horsepower categories that have not been able to get to these levels. And the manufacturers have had some issues with that. So as we go further, they, they're still working on that. And I'll give you one other thing that's happening right now. And that is that there, there are companies and individuals and regulators that are working on tier four five or tier five. Okay. But I don't know what's going to happen with that. I don't know when it's going to happen, if it's going to happen, but they're working on that right now. Now, as far as flex engines are concerned, when you have a tier requirement change, let's go with that back to 1998. So in 1998, for the 25 to 49 horsepower, it went from a tier zero, was what the government allowed to be sold for manufacturers to sell, to the very next year, 1999, they had to produce tier ones, a lower emission standard. Now that change actually happened between midnight on December 31st, 1998, and 1201, January 1st, 1999. Now, all the manufacturers, do you think that they sold all their old engines by that time? Do you think they had components to build the old engine still in, in the factory? Absolutely, they did. So there is a flexibility program that the federal government has allowed for years where the manufacturers can make and sell the older engines, even though they're not legally allowed to because the tier change. For the first six months of a tier change, they're allowed to do this. If they have an engine like that, that is called a flexibility engine because it meets a flexibility program allowed by the federal government. After the six months is over, they're not allowed to sell any more of those engines for use in the United States. I'm only bringing that part up because I've had a, a, several cases happen where people have purchased engines online and they look at the tag and it says not legal for sale in the United States. So you're not supposed to really sell that engine in the United States. But it's because it was a, an engine that was manufactured after that flexibility program. And the manufacturer still had all those things. They still wanted to sell those engines, but they had to be sold outside the country. And sometimes you can find those on auctions. And if you try and bring it in the country and try and run it, you're not going to have a good time when somebody from a regulatory agency finds out. You're not going to be able to certify it. It's, not, it's going to make your fleet illegal. There's a whole bunch of issues with that. All right. So I want you to remember something because this is going to be my, uh, my, um, Example, I'm going to create a fleet and I'm going to show you how the formula is calculated. My fleet has 10 vehicles. I have nine that are 25 horsepower, 1998 engines. What's the emission rate for that? 7.1 grams per rate horsepower hour. So I have nine of those. And I have one engine that is the same model year, but it's 780 horsepower. What's the emission factor that's allowed for that one? 8.9. So those are the two numbers that, um, that I want you to remember. Let me see here. Let me do it on this slide, and then I'll, I'll erase the information here. So when, you put, when I put my information into the fleet calculator, into doors, it's going to create a formula of my fleet. And the formula is going to go like this. It's going to be 9. I'm sorry for my writing. I'm doing it on the mouse here, so it's not that great. 9 times... 
25 times, what was the emission factor for the 25? 7.1. And it's gonna that's that's for my nine 25 horsepower engines. Now I had another engine though. I had one. Times 780. And then what was the emission factor for the 780? Eight. Point nine. Sorry about that nine there. Okay, so going back to high school, that's my numerator. That's the top of my calculation. I have to have a denominator, the bottom of my calculation. And that one is going to be nine times 25 plus one times 780. And again, I apologize for the scratch there, but that's the best I can do without having a stylus of some kind. That's how you calculate your fleet average. That's how the system calculates your fleet average every time. The only difference is your engines would be put in there. If you had 20 engines, three of them were 25 horsepower, you'd have one set for that whatever the emission factor is of that particular engine. And you'd have to go to the tier chart to find out what your emission factor is. This is why I'm saying if you don't like math, don't worry about it because the system goes does all that for you in the background. But this is how it's calculated. Now, here's the question. Which of these engines is going to have more impact on the actual number we see here? The 780, the big one. If I could change all nine of the 25 horsepower engines and buy brand new tier four finals, and I would still be out of compliance. Because when we're talking about emission factors, what is that? That's a unit of mass over time. And 7.1 is not that much different than 8.9. But if we're talking about mass emission rates, total amount of emissions, how much, which one puts out more emissions, the 780 horsepower or the 25 horsepower? The 780, a lot more emissions. So if our goal is to totally reduce emissions, we want that kind of engine taken out and updated before we want the 25 horsepower ones. That is why this is a horsepower weighted average. And that is why the regulation is horsepower weighted. In that formula that I showed you, where I had the number of the horsepower rating of my engines, the number of engines times an emission factor, and then I, I had all that calculation going on. That was my actual fleet average because it was based on the actual engine emission factors. When we calculate your target, the other half of the equation that I was talking about earlier, we use these numbers. We don't go by model year of the engine anymore. We go by compliance year. So right now we're in 2023. So instead of using your actual emission factors, when we calculate your target, we would go to this and we find out your horsepower category. So in the calculation, when I'm calculating my target for my fleet, I would put nine times 4.7 times 25. And I would put one times 780 times 5.5. That target's going to be way lower than what my average is. And every year, as you can see, those numbers go down. 24, it goes to 4.4, 4.1, all the way down to 3.3 for that small category of engine. All right, that's the fleet average. That's how it's calculated. That's how it works. If your fleet isn't compliant with the fleet average, another option you have is to follow the backed method. Backed credits are still available, and the backed method is still a way your fleet can comply today. For medium and large fleets, the backed credits that were previously banked or any credits that had accumulated from retiring equipment expired in 2023. Medium and large fleets will be starting over from zero as far as the backed credits, but if you retire over 10% of your fleet, you can still bank credits. So say you retire 12% of your fleet this year, 2% of that will still roll over to the following compliance year. In order to generate backed credit, you do have to have at least 10% for a fleet turnover. And you must apply that turnover to tier zero and one vehicles first. All of these actions need to be completed before January 1st of the compliance year. So um, in December of the year prior to the compliance year. For small fleets, because the deadline is in 2028, 
your credits are still accumulating, you're able to use previous credits and you will still be able to use credits again until 2028. The actions that you can use in this method, number one, you could turn things over, which means you can retire or sell. You can designate something currently as permanent low use. You get, you get credit, backed credit, equal to the horsepower rating of the piece of equipment. If I said in my imaginary 10 vehicle Just fleet to, add to, to this, designate for my medium 780 and large horsepower fleets, engine, even though the whatever that was, at the of end of the timeline, was, I was designate you can it as permanent begin low generating use. credits again I would now. Get a Your credit previous of credits just are not horsepower horsepower So you can start over again. Back credits are still available, but the, the previous credits you generated That's a big deal. expired that would, that at the end of the timeline in 2023. You could repower with a cleaner engine. Y'all know the difference between repower and rebuild? Both those are terms used to describe something with an engine. When you rebuild an engine, you're not changing its emission standard. You're taking old worn out components and replacing them with the same components, but new. You're making it like it was when it was new, but you're not changing the, the certification standard of the engine. If it was a tier two before, it's a tier two after. To repower something means you're basically changing the engine out. You're going to put a newer engine in. Sometimes you can use old parts or parts of the old engine. Sometimes you have to take the old engine completely out and put a whole new one in. But that's what repower is versus rebuilt. In this case, we want the engines to be a higher tier. So it's a repower that we're looking for. You can retrofit in the back method. If you put filters on, you get credit for that. It does keep you in compliance, even though we're not requiring you to do it. Now. Um, there is one catch with that, and that is that if you if you do it, if you put a filter on, you're going to be responsible if there's an OSHA issue with it blocking the view of the operator, because we're not requiring it. It's an option at that point. Okay. Credits expire at the end of the timeline. So we have some medium and large fleets in here that if they had existing credits uh, January 1st of 2023, they went away. For uh, all fleets, we don't want you to include or apply back to any engine that's newer. So if you have a vehicle that's 10 years old or it's a very special vehicle that's hard to replace for whatever reason, we don't want you touching that vehicle. Don't replace it. It's exempt from having back applied to it. Um, if it has an OEM diesel particulate filter, we don't want you to touch that. If it's a tier four interim or tier four final, those are the newer engines. We don't want you touching those. So don't do anything to those if you're following the back method. For the medium and large fleets, if you've installed the filtration system in the last six years, until that filter gets to six years old, the vehicle itself is exempt from having back applied to it. For smaller fleets, it's all about, is there a filter available? If you're, having, if you're going to install a filter and you're gonna use that as backs, we don't want you to have to, we're not gonna require you to do it on a vehicle that there is no filter available for. So until the filter is available and ready and able to be purchased, that particular vehicle would be exempt from having back applied to it. Sounds like a lot of numbers, a lot of calculations, a lot of decisions have to be made for you to decide, you know, which vehicles you're gonna upgrade, which vehicles are gonna be low use, all, all that information. There is a tool that is available to you if you want to take advantage of it, and it's called the Fleet Calculator. It is a spreadsheet we created, and it's downloadable on uh, the off-road website within your account, and I think you can download it without even being in the account. And basically, it'll work for any fleet, whether you're following the back method or the fleet average. And what it does, I'll show you a picture of it. This is the, the intro page that gives you instructions. You can download, like I said, from Doors, and you can populate it with your Doors account information by just doing a download of the data in your Doors account or by copying and pasting either one. When you open the spreadsheet, it just looks like an Excel spreadsheet because that's what it is. The only information that you actually need to have are the engine model year and the engine horsepower. 
with that information, it will tell you what your fleet average is, and it will give you the option of making selections on each of those pieces of equipment. Most of these selections here are choices that you have to make, like low use, for example. You get to choose that in the spreadsheet here without actually doing it to your vehicles. That's the idea. You can change your fleet up offline, outside of doors, and see which vehicles do the best for you as far as complying with the fleet average or back methods. That's the whole purpose of the fleet calculator. There are some other provisions we do need to talk about, and these do include more changes that happened with the update. Time contractor. So when you hire a contractor to do something, the state contractor's license board has control over their license, and they call the person who's license number is the main one for whatever job they're signing the contract for. They call that person the prime contractor. And they differentiate between that person and any other contractors that are working on the job for specific duties. They call those subcontractors. And so in the off-road regulation, we have to use the same kind of deal because you have people who hire the use of vehicles that they don't own. So in that case, they become the prime contractor. And they may hire subcontractors, sub haulers, sub whatever you want to call. And the, the reason we're doing that is because if you have a prime contractor, or if you are a prime contractor, you have an obligation to hire compliant subs. And it is possible that if you hired a sub and that sub was not compliant in any way, you could be cited as if that was your equipment. So one of the new definitions in the modifications to the rule happens to deal with this relationship between prime contractors and subcontractors and prime contractors and job sites. There's also language right here that you are now required if you have this situation where you're hiring subs or you have a prime contractor, you're required to post this just like you do the all the safety stuff that OSHA requires. Um, you know that big wall you have in your your employee office or your employee room where you have like a dozen or two dozen different pieces of text that have to be posted somewhere where everybody can read them. This is another one of those postings. Okay? We give you the language, it's verbatim, just use that language. Let's talk about a alternate path. Bring this up here. And it only applies to those fleets that are really small. This thing I'm talking about here only applies to very small fleets operating in California. And this would be if all of your equipment combined is no more than 500 total horsepower. So very small fleets, maybe a few couple of skid loaders or skip loaders or, or uh, skid steers actually, or other small units. If that's you, then you have the ability to go through this particular set of standards rather than all the stuff that we've already talked about. I mean, you still have to report, you still have to do that stuff. But instead of meeting a fleet average, instead of following back method, you can follow this. And what this does for you is it allows you to uh, only have to get to, to tier two or higher engines in your fleet as long as you met these percentages. So the first two have already happened. So you had to, half of your fleet has to already be tier two in order to fall under this. But you could operate, you know, half two to tier two and half tier zero if you wanted to, if you were a small fleet, a very small fleet. The catch with this one is that since we're already in this, you can't actually designate yourself this fleet. You have to go through the staff that run the reporting system in order to do this. Uh, and they can put you in. They'll go through and verify what you have and make sure you meet all the conditions and then they can put you in. And the advantage to this is obviously you can run older equipment for a longer period of time. And you're in full compliance once you get to all tier two or higher. Then let's talk about low use. And I'm gonna talk about the existing low use and where we're going with it. So until the Office of Administrative Law passes the modifications to this rule, we are still currently in this set where there are two different low uses. One that's really flexible and one that's not so flexible. The really flexible one is called year by year. And the, the reason it's flexible is number one, you can put a vehicle into low use in a compliance year. And then next year, if you decide to, you can take it out and there's no penalty. So if, as long as it stays in for a whole compliance year, it could go back and forth. The second flexibility is that in, we use a three-year rolling average to determine your low use. The, the total low use per year is 200 hours max. But if you went 250 hours one year, last year, 
And the year before that, you did 150. The introduction of the rolling average into permanent low so use as long as is an option. Rolling average it's not a requirement. Or less, so you can to choose to, to stay under 200 hours per year, year on an annual basis, but there will now also the be the option use to use the rolling exactly average the in implies. permanent low use. It's permanent. When the Once you designate are something as permanent, it's low use. You can't ever take it out of low use. The other part of the permanent low use is currently in place again that is more stringent is that it's you, we're not using a rolling average in this particular case. It is 200 hours and no more than 200 hours. If you ever go over 200 hours, the only way you can bring that vehicle back into your fleet is if it's not part of the tier ban. So what is the tier ban right now, tier three? If it's a tier two or less, you're not gonna be allowed to bring that thing into use if you go over the 200 hours. Now, remember those two differences because the change in the rule actually is going to update this to combine the two. It's going to be called permanent low use, but it's going to have some of both characteristics of the previous low uses. The first characteristic that it's going to have of the year by year is instead of using just last year's numbers, we're going to have a three-year rolling average. Even though it's permanent, it's going to be a three-year rolling average. The part of the permanent low use that it's being folded into this is the fact that it's no more than 200 hours. And you can never take it out of low use. You got the roll on average, it's got to be less than 200 hours. And once it's designated as low use, you can never take it out of low use. All right, let's talk about renewable diesel. This is a new amendment to the regulation. It's not a modification of an existing one. The low use was a modification. The other one, the tier ban and the extension, those were all modifications. This is something brand new. And the in the modification of the regulation, it was added that going forward on, on particular dates, all fleets in the state of California, with some minor exceptions, are going to have to use renewable diesel rather than standard carb diesel. All right, so I put this in here because I, I want to explain to you the differences. You've heard of renew, you've heard of biodiesel, right? Okay, you've heard of just regular diesel. We call that petro diesel because it comes from petroleum. And there's renewable diesel. Petro diesel, that's a process that everybody has known for decades and decades and decades. You take dinosaur juice out of the ground. You put it through a distillation process. It makes different types of fuels. One of them is diesel fuel. And it has to meet specific standards in order to be legal to use in California because we require it to have low sulfur and we're on low volatiles. So it will be carb diesel. That's what that is. And you can see that we have a bunch of different characteristics or properties shown for petro diesel or carb diesel. Biodiesel which everybody's been high on for a long time. That's the one where you take oil, like French fry oil, you put it through a process where it adds oxygen molecules to it, breaks it down, reforms it, and you create a diesel fuel oil that can be burned in diesel engines. There's several issues with biodiesel. Number one, you cannot burn pure biodiesel in diesel engines, not unless you want the manufacturer to completely void your warranty because biodiesel's lubricity is much lower than standard diesel. And it, unless you have very special types of gaskets, Viton gaskets is one of the examples, it will eat your engine up using 100% biodiesel. That's why almost all manufacturers, engine manufacturers specify no more than B20, which is a 20% blend of biodiesel with carb diesel. Okay? The other problems with biodiesel is because it has high oxygen contents, again, the way it's made, it breaks down. It breaks down fairly. It oxidizes and breaks down. So you can't store it for very long. And you can't store it in the same containers that you do standard diesel. You can't transport it in the same vehicles without cleaning them out and redoing them in the same containers. You can't send it through the same pipes. It's a new infrastructure has to be put in place for biodiesel. And you have to keep them separate. The blend happens when you're just getting ready to use the fuel just before you send it out somewhere. 
Now, renewable diesel is not using organic oils and material like that to create the diesel. It uses um, cellulose-containing material like uh, wood chips or hay or straw or grass. And you put it through a, a chemical process where you make a diesel fuel that almost in every way is just like standard carb diesel. It has very close to the same amount of energy. It has very similar lubrosity, very similar cetane numbers. Uh, it doesn't have uh, hardly any oxygen in it, so it could be stored in the same containers. It can be sent in the same trucks. It can be sent through the same pipes. It, uh, in some cases, it will actually provide more energy, so you get better fuel economy with it. So it's got a lot of positives, but that's not why we're requiring it. Why we're requiring it has to do with greenhouse gases. Okay, so if I pull dinosaur juice out of the ground, I know that's a silly term, but if I pull petrol oil out of the ground, that's carbon atoms that have been sequestered for millions of years. They're not in our atmosphere, they're buried. But we're taking them out and we're putting them in the atmosphere. So we're increasing the greenhouse gas issue. If we use biodiesel, we are using carbon atoms that are already out, but in many cases, there are parts of the world where the they're renewable diesel requirement is set to begin like January 1st, 2024. Home plantations to create oil, to create biodiesel. There's corn isn't, well, corn makes ethanol, but I mean, you get what I'm saying? You're, you're actually, you're not helping the greenhouse gas issue by using that, aside from all the lubrosity issues and things, you're hurting the greenhouse gas issue in many ways by using biodiesel. Pet, I mean, uh, renewable diesel, you're taking gas, uh, or grass, sorry, grass and um, wood chips. Those are from plant material that have collected CO2 out of the air, encapsulated it, and then you're putting it back into the air. So it's a circle. You're not adding carbon atoms, you're just putting carbon atoms that were already in the air and then taken out and then back in the air. So when you look at it from a greenhouse gas perspective, it's a zero, net zero gain. And in some cases, it's a you lose carbon atoms in the process. By that, I mean, you take them out and they never go back. That's why we're requiring new, renewable diesel. So the, the change is going to require the use of 100% renewable diesel with a few exceptions. Number one, if you have all tier four final, you could be exempt from having that having to use that. There are certain parts of the state that aren't going to be required to use it. Okay? If you're in one of the cleaner NOx areas, you're not going to be required. If renewable diesel is not available, and right now it depends on who you shop with, renewable diesel could be significantly less. Could be equal, could be a little bit more. But the cost parameter is not one of the exemptions. It's the fact of availability that's going to drive an exemption. Also, if you designate something as permanent low use, you're not required to use renewable diesel in those vehicles. There's also an extension and has been forever. So one of the biggest deals that we've had recently, like since COVID, has been supply chain. Trying to get equipment to comply with our rules when the equipment manufacturers are not producing it as fast or their supply chain is interrupted or something's wrong, they can't get it to you. So in this rule and our on-road regulations, there's a stipulation that as long as you have been as long as you are in contracts, and that means a written contract with a deposit to purchase a piece of equipment to comply with this rule, as long as it was done by a specific date, then you're considered compliant until that piece of equipment arrives. That date is November This is 1st, a summary of the regulation. proposed off-road diesel so amendments. You, uh, Again, this year, let's say you you're trying to comply with next year, law, and you need and a new piece of equipment, or you need to, you. Repower, so to rehash, the there is a proposed backstop on old equipment starting with Tier 0 and moving through Tier 2. Happen, and they're extending the tier ban through Tier 4 interim. There's a proposed renewable diesel requirement, as well as changes to the low-use provision. Out-of-state and new fleets. One of the it's not really a question. One of the complaints that we've got over time has been, you know, you're requiring me to comply with this. I've been going through this phase and doing all this stuff. And then I've got somebody from Nevada that comes in and steals my job and they're not compliant. Uh, they're supposed to be. They will get cited uh, if, if obviously we have to find out about it. But 
they don't get the benefit of any kind of phase in. They don't get the benefit of any of the flexibilities in this regulation. They don't get the benefit of a back method. If it's a new fleet coming brand new to the state or it's from out of state coming in, whatever their fleet uh, average emission rate is, at the time we do the calculation, they have to meet whatever the target is for that size fleet. Now, there is the possibility, and I've seen this myself actually, where you can see a fleet and none of the vehicles are labeled. So you think they're completely out of compliance. How many days do you have to label your vehicles once you 30? So they could be in that 30 day window. So be aware that's a possibility. Uh, what's the, what has the greatest effect on the fleet average for each piece of equipment, the emission factor or the horsepower? Yeah, I kind of beat that into your heads a little bit. It's a horsepower. The bigger the engine, the more it's going to affect your calculation. Last thing we'd say about the amendments is this, that they're going to happen, but they haven't happened yet. And that they're not in effect yet, but they will be before the end of this year. If you need more information, we've got lots of links here. Uh, if you want to get sent information by us about any particular topic, especially this one, we do have a listserv. Some of you found out about this class via that listserv. If you sign up, give us your email, we'll send you information directly on whatever topic you need to get from us. Resources information. You still have the ability to purloin public funding for some things if you want to go down that avenue. And by that, I mean that um, there is public funding to change old vehicles out for new vehicles. Several different funding programs. Is this the final funding sources for the usually require today, uh, like two to five year webpage, time period that you have to be you before you actually link. have to do something. We also have the, the off-road zone available. So you have to do it in advance of when the requirement says you have you to do it. You can view the proposed amendment schedule and arena, documentation and the proposed amendments webpage. Essentially, that's a. And we have the doors. I loved it when this one came out because that one actually doesn't require you to get brand new equipment. What it, what it does is it says you need to get newer equipment. So if you're running a tier zero, you could get farmer funding to replace it with a tier two or tier three. And the idea is just to, just to get rid of the old stuff and get newer stuff in. Carl Moyer is a funding program that's been around for years. It's part of your DMV registration. There's a small dollar amount that comes out every year. And that has produced more funding and more turnover of vehicles than probably any other funding program that we've ever had. And it's still going. And they've they've changed the rules so that it's more flexible. Uh, I will tell you that that and um, the mitigation funds, as well as a lot of other funds that are out there, are pushing more for electric than anything else. And if it's in, if it's at all possible for you to go with something electric versus diesel or any kind of combustion, you can get funding for that before you can get funding for almost anything else. If you go to uh, arb.ca truck stop. Right on the main page that comes up is going to be a little dollar sign icon that says funding programs. If you click on that, it'll link to everything. Okay. If you don't want to go there, just go to their district office too. They have or call them. A lot of the funding programs are run through local agencies versus the state agency. We let them make decisions on a local basis with those monies. So they run whole groups that do nothing but that.